Due to the graphic nature of this murder case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of suicide, murder, and assault. It also includes sexual themes that may not be appropriate for younger listeners. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. On Thursday, September 8, 1932, newspapers hit the stands in Los Angeles with the eye-grabbing headline, Burn Autopsy Bears Reason for His Suicide. The suicide in question was that of 42-year-old Paul Byrne, a high-level executive at MGM, one of the most notable film studios at the time. The beloved producer's body had been found three days earlier. He was splayed out on the floor of his mansion, surrounded by a pool of blood. This newspaper story, and many others like it, said Paul had struggled with depression and suicidal ideation for his entire life, and his recent marriage to 21-year-old starlet Jean Harlow had made things worse than ever. According to the article, Paul had a secret, a condition that might negatively affect the more intimate parts of his marriage. In other words, Paul Byrne was impotent, unable to satisfy his movie star wife. Not only that, but his wife's fame was slowly overtaking his own. Those two factors made life no longer worth living. He felt he had no option but to take his own life. But we have no way of knowing if these stories were true. In fact, we don't even know if Paul took his own life. A group of MGM executives arrived at Paul's home a full six hours before any law enforcement did. Multiple researchers have theorized that they manipulated the crime scene to create this narrative. And for years, no one had any idea. Some of Hollywood's biggest names didn't hesitate to throw their former colleague's reputation under the bus, spreading lies about his mental and physical health. What happened during those six hours would change how the general public viewed Paul Byrne's death and his entire legacy, but it would succeed in covering up the truth that in all likelihood, Paul had been murdered. This is our second episode on the death of Paul Byrne, the famous MGM writer, producer, and director whose sudden death shook Hollywood to its core. But even though his death was initially labeled a suicide, there is a shocking amount of evidence to suggest otherwise. We have all that and more coming up. Stay with us. On the morning of September 5th, 1932, Paul Burns Butler found the 42-year-old movie producer dead in his Beverly Hills mansion. He lay naked on the ground in his walk-in closet, surrounded by a pool of blood. A gun rested to his right. Paul's personal chef rushed in soon after the butler. She called out to Paul's mother-in-law, known as Mama Jean, who also lived in the mansion. Strangely, instead of calling the police, Mama Jean opted to contact an executive at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios. She probably knew how valuable Paul and his wife, 21-year-old Jean Harlow, were to the MGM image, and she wanted to check with the boss before allowing law enforcement and press to get involved. When word reached the studio's co-founder, Louis B. Mayer, he nearly fainted. He could hardly believe it. Paul was one of the best producers that MGM had on their roster, and Jean was a rising star. So, after Mayer got over the initial shock, he jumped into action. But what exactly Mayer did next is up for debate. In fact, almost all of MGM's activity around Paul Byrne's death cannot be confirmed. Multiple researchers have made the case that Mayer led his fellow executives to manipulate the crime scene and plant a false story about how Paul Byrne died. But there just isn't enough evidence out in the open to say for sure. Paul Byrne's biographer, E.J. Fleming, provides a detailed account of what might have happened next in his book, Paul Byrne, The Life and Famous Death of the MGM Director and Husband of Harlow. This book also contains some of the recollections of high-level MGM employee Samuel Marks. Marks was a member of Mayer's inner circle, 
and with the help of co-author Joyce Vanderveen, he published his account of Paul's death in the book Deadly Illusions. But many of Marx's details cannot be independently verified, especially about MGM's internal response to Paul's death. But according to both Fleming and Marx, Louis B. Mayer thought it was a potential PR nightmare and the studio had to act fast. Paul and Jean's marriage had been a massive win for MGM. The media couldn't resist the story of an MGM producer falling in love with one of their buzziest contracted actresses. The couple's every move was featured in the tabloids, billed as the perfect Hollywood romance. And all that free publicity could easily translate into ticket sales. But now, with Paul dead, the power couple narrative might be warped into something more sinister. Not to mention, Mayer knew that there were certain aspects of Paul and Jean's marriage that the public didn't know, and Paul's death could cause people to start digging. He couldn't have that. After trying to comfort the hysterical Mama Jean, Mayer began making calls. Within minutes, MGM studio police chief Richard Hendry and head of publicity Howard Strickling rushed over to Paul's home. They needed to keep press away while the MGM executives figured out how to take control of the narrative. But then Mayer remembered the dozens of people who worked in Paul's home. If Mama Jean knew, so did scores of butlers, chefs, and groundskeepers. None of these people had any media training or knew what this meant for the studio. Their first instinct would be to contact the police. And according to Fleming, that was the last thing Mayer wanted to happen. The situation needed to be finessed before anyone from outside the studio found out. Luckily for Mayer, he had a friend who could lend a hand. Hollywood scriptwriter Al Cohn. Al, you there? Mayer? Jeez, you sound awful. What's going on? What I'm about to tell you does not get repeated. Not until I say it's okay, and by then the world's gonna know. But right now, I need you to swear secrecy. You got it? All right, all right. Take it easy, Louie. What on earth is happening that has you so cranky? Your personal chef not make the coffee strong enough for you this morning? Paul Byrne is dead. Bullet in the skull. We don't know who did it. We don't know if he did it. We don't know anything. But he's dead. I, I don't know what to say. You still mess with those police scanners? I, I mean, sure. But what does that have to do with any of this? I need you listening to them and listening good. If you so much as hear a single utterance of the name Paul Byrne, you call me immediately. You drop everything and you call me. I see. This will cost you. I'm well aware, Al. Do as I say and do a good job. And then we can have that conversation. With the team en route to Paul's home and the police lines being monitored, Mayer felt a hint of relief. If his lackeys moved quickly and efficiently, they could create a narrative that would minimize the impact on the studio, even if Paul's reputation was bruised in the process. However, the other MGM executives who received the news that morning weren't quite as concerned with optics. The head of production, Irving Thalberg, had a close relationship with the now-deceased producer. Paul had started as Thalberg's assistant when he first moved to Hollywood. The executive completely fell apart when he heard the news. The studio's well-being didn't even enter his mind. Thalberg rushed to Paul's estate. Out front, he saw a young set photographer on the scene, tiptoeing around puddles of blood and snapping shots of the gruesome display. Nearby, the MGM executives were huddled together, whispering to one another. About two hours had passed since Paul's body was found, not a single call had been made to police or medical professionals. Irving Thalberg couldn't bear to enter Paul's home. The thought of seeing his friend's dead body was too much for him to handle. But as the shock wore off, he was able to put together the pieces and realize what was happening. He sat by the fence and somberly reflected on his dear friend. He thought about all the films they worked on together the glasses of champagne they clinked, and all the pain and joy they shared. His moment of remembrance was cut short when a new figure approached. 
Paul's neighbor, Slavko Vorkapich, had heard the commotion and stopped by to see what was going on. When the execs told him what had happened to Paul, he recalled something peculiar from the night before. What do you mean, strange? Did you see something? Hear something? Well, first, early in the evening, a limo pulled up, and it wasn't jeans. I had never seen it before. Then a woman wearing all black steps out and saunters right in through Paul's door. And she stayed for a while? It seemed that way, and, and it gets stranger. It was in the middle of the night. It had to be two, maybe three in the morning. I heard all this laughing and splashing water. Paul and this other woman clearly were having a good time, but then it got uh, aggressive. How do you mean, aggressive? You know, like shouting and such. I couldn't make out the words, but it was a fight. No doubt about it. And then it just stopped. But it just didn't feel right. And that's it then? Well, no. Just before 3 a.m., that same limo screeches out of the driveway. And I mean like a bat out of hell. Whoever was in that limo needed to leave, and leave quick. Okay, Slav. How about you head home and get some rest? Don't talk to anyone. And don't tell anyone what you've just told us. Not even the police. Especially not the police. But how about you go home and get some rest? Slavko retreated down the long driveway and soon was out of sight. Mayor Thalberg and the rest of the MGM men stood silently, shooting glances at one another. They didn't say a word, but were all thinking the same thing. For the past few months, the studio had been receiving disturbing phone calls from a woman in San Francisco. She claimed to be Paul Byrne's ex-girlfriend and threatened to spread rumors about their past unless she could star in his next film. They knew that this woman wasn't just an unstable fan. She and Paul did have a serious relationship. And even though they'd broken up more than a decade before, Paul was still financially supporting her. He cared about her. And perhaps a little more importantly, he couldn't say no. If she asked for a limo ride from the Bay all the way to Los Angeles in the middle of the night, especially after threatening to ruin his career, he would almost certainly oblige. This woman's name was Dorothy Millett. Louis Mayer and the rest of the men were certain she was responsible for Paul's death. But that didn't mean anyone else had to know. Coming up, the men of MGM manipulate the scene of Paul Byrne's death in order to keep their studio safe. At around 11 a.m. on September 5, 1932, a group of MGM executives gathered at Paul Byrne's house in Los Angeles. They'd heard about his death only two hours before and now needed to figure out how to tell the public. Time was of the essence as the police were sure to arrive any second. E.J. Fleming's book argues that the executives wanted to present Paul's death in a way that would guarantee as little blowback to the studio as possible, and they didn't care if the facts had to be altered to get there. However, they'd caught wind of something that could stand in the way of the entire plan. The night before Paul's death, he received a visit from an unidentified woman. The two were heard screaming at one another, and then, half an hour later, the woman's limo bolted out of the driveway. Thalberg, Mayer, and the rest had a very good hunch as to who this woman was, Dorothy Millette. She had been romantically involved with Paul throughout the 1910s. As their relationship developed, her mental health deteriorated. Paul broke it off and checked her into a mental institution in 1920, after that, he moved to Hollywood but continued to support Dorothy financially. For more than a decade, the relationship stayed amicable. Paul sent Dorothy just about anything she could ever wish for, and Dorothy stayed out of Paul's affairs. But once news about his marriage to Jean Harlow began circulating in the papers, that all changed. Dorothy began calling and sending letters to Paul and insisted on moving closer to her former flame, Paul, ever the people-pleaser, couldn't say no. 
he put her up in a fancy hotel in San Francisco, probably hoping it would be enough to keep her out of his hair. But it didn't work. Just before Paul's death, Dorothy began calling the MGM offices, threatening to come to Hollywood and reveal horrible secrets about Paul, unless he cast her in a movie. Given their history, it wouldn't be a huge surprise if Paul's late-night visitor was Dorothy. To be sure, Mayer decided to make one more call. Check the company car logs. Were any of our limos called out last night? Yeah, uh, last night I see that one was called by a Paul... Paul Byrne? Yep, he needed it in a hurry, too. It's weird. We were expecting it back the next morning, but our driver was back at the depot around 4 a.m., told me whoever it was he was driving around was real strange, too. Super nervous. And cagey. Perfect. In his book, Fleming asserts that the limo that arrived at Paul Burns' house the previous night was an MGM company car, in which case the truth seemed unavoidable. It looked like Paul had called a car for Dorothy, the conversation had taken a turn, and she shot him. Mayer knew that this story could not leak to the press. It would be a disaster for MGM, poking a major hole in the story of marital bliss they'd been selling for months, and it could lead reporters to dig deeper into Paul's past, which could cause even more problems. And according to some of Thalberg's sources, the story was already starting to circulate. They needed to act now. One of the men gathered at Paul's mansion was MGM Studio Police Chief Richard Hendry. After several years in the Culver City Police Department, Hendry was well-equipped to deal with crime scenes. The former cop led the rest of the executives into the bedroom, where they finally got a look at their deceased colleague. And allegedly, Hendry came to an immediate conclusion. Well, what do you think? This is a murder. Plain and simple. Why do you sound so sure? You see where the gun is? About six or seven feet away from the body? Yeah? What of it? Wise up, Mayor. How do you think it got there? You think he shot his brains out and then tossed the thing into the middle of the room? Someone killed him, and then threw the gun off to the side, likely in a state of shock. I've seen it before. Not only would a murder case be far too damning for the studio to deal with, but the executives knew exactly how the media would frame it. Jean would be the first target. She was young, volatile, and the perfect face for the story. They would implicate her in Paul's death somehow. Something about her youth and vitality driving the old and fading producer to insanity or intense jealousy causing her to kill. A headline like that could tank the studio. They needed to think of an alternative. Louis Mayer started searching the room. He picked up Paul's leather-bound guest book, flipping past friendly entries from A-listers like Gary Cooper. Just as he was about to move on, he found an entry that seemed to be the solution to everything. Dearest dear, Unfortunately, this is the only way to make good the frightful wrong I have done you and wipe out my abject humiliation. I love you. You understand that last night was only a comedy. Yours always, Paul. E.J. Fleming's book alleges that Mayer showed this page to Howard Strickling, director of publicity, and the two knew what they'd stumbled onto. Though it's still unclear what the entry was actually referring to or who it was meant for, the men knew it could easily be sold as a suicide note. Sure, nothing in the entry mentioned suicide or even the thought of suicide, but it was seeping with remorse. According to Fleming, they decided it was the best option they had. So Mayer placed Paul's entry back as if he never found it, and moved the book to its original spot in the bedroom for police to find. Now it was time to stage the scene. Perhaps working in movies for as long as these men had was finally paying off. According to Fleming's research, what followed was like something found only on the silver screen. 
Fleming's book alleges that Richard Henry picked up the gun from the middle of the room and wiped it clean of prints. He tried to place it in Paul's hand, but Paul had been dead for several hours and rigor mortis had already started to set in. He wouldn't budge. After some finagling, Henry reportedly jammed the pistol into Paul's cold palm. It stuck out at an awkward angle, but looked believable enough. Next up on the docket was Paul's wife, 21-year-old Jean Harlow. The men knew they needed her cooperation in order for any of this to work, and luckily for them, she didn't know her husband was dead yet. The MGM executives could present the suicide story as fact. Jean had another home in Westwood, a neighborhood of Los Angeles. She had been there since five the night before. Louis Mayer took it upon himself to drive over and tell her the news. At first, Jean was so shocked that, according to Fleming's research, she believed every word of it. Mayer heavily implied that her husband had been driven to suicide, which was devastating and confusing to her. Jean thought her husband told her everything, and he'd never even hinted at depression or a desire to end his life. When Mayer pressed her to help handle the media coverage of Paul's death, her sadness and confusion turned to anger. Jean, come on. All I'm asking is for you to do a few interviews. It'll all be so much cleaner that way. We can preserve Paul's legacy and not leave it all up to speculation. None of this makes sense. And you want me to stand in front of those vultures and say that my husband killed himself? I refuse to take part in any of this. I refuse to believe any of this is even happening. What about a simple written statement? Just acknowledging what happened. Just to keep people from guessing. It's what Paul would have wanted, don't you think? You leave this house. I'm not playing along with your game. This isn't some business deal. This isn't about publicity or the media or the papers. It's about my husband. He's dead and you're concerned about speculation. You disgust me. (sighs) Half an hour later, Jean's maid, Blanche Williams, called the Harlow family doctor, who lured Jean from her room and sedated her, likely using barbiturates. Fleming's book argues that after Mayer dealt with Harlow, the MGM executives figured it was finally safe to call the police. By this point, a full six hours had passed since Paul Byrne's body was found. When the police arrived, they quickly labeled Paul's death a straightforward suicide. If the executives truly did pull off such a staging, they likely breathed a collective sigh of relief. However, it was one thing to fool the police... Convincing the press was another thing entirely. The papers that hit the newsstands the next morning, September 6th, 1932, speculated wildly on the case. The press refused to believe the police's narrative because to them it just didn't make sense. The so-called suicide note was cryptic, and Paul didn't seem to have any reason to end his own life. Unfortunately, many people doubted the suicide angle because they thought his wife, Jean Harlow, killed him. Some theorized it was jealousy from a supposed affair or a deep-seated professional dispute. Regardless of the finer details, the story that Jean was a murderer was sticking. Now the MGM men had a separate problem. If this theory continued to gain traction, that would completely ruin Jean's career. And because Jean was a contracted leading lady and, effectively, the face of the studio, she could take the whole company down with her. The story they'd allegedly planted still seemed like their best bet, but they needed to make it more believable. Fleming's book details an emergency meeting in Louis Mayer's office that night. With his team of lackeys around him, he called his doctor and close friend Edward B. Jones. Maybe the doctor could supply a possible reason why an outwardly successful and happy man like Paul would put a bullet through his brain. We can get people to testify about depression, even suicidal ideation. But those are small potatoes. What we really need is something juicy for the press. Something these bloodthirsty reporters can really sink their teeth into, you know? Hmm, something salacious? Exactly. Well... I've certainly dealt with my fair share of depressed men. 
And one thing you see a lot is sexual inadequacy. It can really take a toll. Defining yourself in a marriage to a woman like Jean, no less. But being unable to consummate the relationship, well, that can drive a man insane. That's it. That's the ticket. According to Fleming's research, the MGM executives tacked a new angle onto the story after this call. They wanted to imply that Paul Byrne was impotent. Bad luck in the bedroom led to a spiral of depression and self-loathing that ultimately ended with his suicide. He wrote the note to Jean as a final apology for never being able to sexually satisfy her. This new iteration seemed perfect. It would keep Gene out of the crosshairs, and most importantly to the executives, it would keep the studio safe. But Mayer knew there were still some details that could topple the executives' lie in an instant, like Dorothy Millette, whose mere existence could ruin the whole charade. And unfortunately for the executives, she was about to come into the fold in a big way. Coming up, the press runs wild with the story of Paul Byrne's suicide, and the hunt for Dorothy Millette begins. And now back to the story. By Tuesday, September 7th, 1932, it seemed as if a smear campaign against the late Paul Byrne was in full swing. In just two days, well-known writers, actors, and other showbiz types began contributing their own observations about Paul's mental health. Some articles relied heavily on unnamed sources who spoke at length about Paul having suicidal tendencies and depression. Some didn't even attempt to legitimize their claims and published outright lies. One publication said that Paul was the sixth person in his bloodline to take his own life, even though this is completely false. Even a fellow film producer and a dear friend of Paul, David O. Selznick, told reporters that Paul was, a quote, student of suicide. And many publications continued to harp on Paul's supposed sexual issues. At the time, it was uncouth to directly discuss another man's sex life in the paper, so his alleged impotence was never stated in clear terms. But many articles hinted at physical impairments that made his marriage difficult. The subtext was obvious to anyone who was paying attention. And while it seemed as though the MGM executives had the media under their thumb, they'd forgotten about one key witness who could offer a different angle to the press. Paul's neighbor, Slavko Vorkapich. So you live next door to Mr. Byrne, is that correct? And you were home the night when he took his own life? Yes, that's right. Was there anything peculiar about that night in particular? Well, it's funny you should mention that. At around three in the morning, a limousine came tearing out of Paul's driveway. I mean, he was a popular guy. was always having friends over and such, but I've never seen anything like that before. I didn't even know a limo could peel out like that. The new angle was in print by that afternoon. Mystery Automobile adds intrigue to the sudden suicide of Paul Byrne. Who was in the car? And why were they in such a hurry? The last thing the MGM executives wanted was for people to look any closer into Paul's death. Who knew what could come out if reporters really started digging? And according to Fleming, the studio knew exactly who the mystery woman was, Dorothy Millette. Paul's former lover with a past of extreme mental illness, manipulation, and blackmail. If people found out about her, everything could change. Later that same day, September 7th, Paul's family finally learned about his death. His brother Henry dropped everything and headed to Los Angeles. Henry arrived in Kansas City, where he would stay the night before finishing his trip to California. A swarm of reporters were waiting for him outside his hotel, hungry for the next sensational twist in the Paul Byrne saga. Mr. Byrne! Mr. Byrne! uh, What can you say about your brother's crippling depression? Did you see this coming? Absolutely not. Paul was a happy and healthy man. 
healthy. What about his uh, impotence? Sources say there were problems in the bedroom. This is how you talk about the dead? Who raised you? You're sick. As far as I know, my brother had no issues in that regard. None at all. And how on earth would you know that? Paul lived his life in the open. He kept nothing from anyone. You want proof? Fine. I'll give you what you want. You want to know just how honest of a man my brother was? He used to be with a woman. They lived together. She had some struggles, and he put her in a sanitarium. But he didn't abandon her. Not at all. He spent every penny he earned to make sure she was taken care of. Most men would keep that to themselves after showing up to Hollywood to start a new life, wouldn't you say? Not Paul. Everyone at MGM knew about her. Jean knew. He hid nothing. Uh, I'm sorry, can we go back a second? Did you just say Paul Byrne had to institutionalize his former lover? Journalists pounced on this new piece of information, and they worked fast. By the next day, the press had figured out that this mystery woman was Dorothy Millette. They found documentation of her relationship with Paul and her history of mental illness, and splashed them all over the gossip columns. But as efficiently as they worked, the media wasn't able to make one final crucial connection. They didn't see Dorothy as a murder suspect. Yet. Perhaps in some way, Dorothy knew this was imminent. As the Hollywood press corps dove into her personal history, she boarded the Delta King, a cruise ship headed toward Sacramento. By 6.30 p.m. on September 7th, around the same time that Henry was giving his impromptu press conference, Dorothy was heading east down the Sacramento-San Joaquin River. By 8.30, San Francisco was a distant memory. Dorothy made her way to the dining car where she feasted on fruit cocktails, spaghetti, and ice cream. The staff noticed Dorothy acting strange. Her movements were jittery, and she was constantly looking over her shoulder. Nervous was an understatement. After returning to her room, she called the ship's porter to request some medication for a headache. No one on the ship saw or heard Dorothy for the rest of the night. Then, at 4.45 a.m., a crew member noticed something peculiar. A long black coat and a pair of brand new shoes were sitting on the deck with no one nearby. When the ship arrived in Sacramento at 7 a.m. on September 8, 1932, everyone exited the Delta King as planned, except for one person. The peculiar woman in room 304 never checked out. The crew and the Sacramento police scoured Dorothy Millette's room. All they found were scattered clothing, $38 in cash, and some cosmetics. If the cops and boat employees had been keeping up with the tabloids, they might have recognized her name, as it was hard to pick up a Hollywood paper without seeing it everywhere. But to everyone aboard the Delta King, she was just another passenger. Her disappearance went under investigation, but no one had the slightest idea that she was implicated in a scandalous Hollywood gossip story. Meanwhile, the media circus surrounding Paul Byrne's reported suicide was picking up steam and growing even more outlandish. One paper claimed that before taking his own life, Paul doused his entire body in a bottle of Jean's favorite perfume. The number of Paul's family members who had killed themselves seemed to grow with each new article. Some reporters even went so far as to suggest that Paul was physically abusive with Jean, or that he was a sexual deviant. If the MGM executives did plant these narratives about Paul, they also convinced dozens of people to parrot them to the press. Even people who Paul would have called his best friends maligned him publicly. It's hard to tell whether the executives contacted everyone who spoke to the press in advance, but they allegedly had a heavy hand in just about every article that was released in the wake of Paul's death. And while the MGM crew may have had plenty of reasons to be pleased, certain things were not going as planned. The search for the mysterious woman in the limousine was going ahead full throttle. Police had gotten suspicious too, and were conducting a statewide search for Dorothy. 
However, one development in the story changed everything. It turned out that Dorothy was more than just Paul's girlfriend. Way back in 1914, the two had a common law marriage. So technically speaking, at the time of his death, Paul Byrne had two wives. The MGM executives already knew about the marriage, but they had no idea just how much they'd benefit from this information. Suddenly, and without any effort on their part, their star, Jean Harlow, became a victim in the eyes of the public. Of course, Jean was also aware of Paul's common-law marriage she'd known for years. But since she refused to speak to the press, they didn't need to worry about the truth. Seemingly overnight, the media went from painting Jean as a heartless murderer to seeing her as a tragic, maligned wife. It was perfect. If Louis Mayer and Irving Thalberg manipulated the story of Paul Byrne's death, they may have been in the clear by now. But still, the story was far from over. On the morning of September 14th, a fisherman and his son were out walking along the Sacramento River. The man stopped abruptly and put his hands over his son's eyes. A decomposing body floated face down a few feet away from them. It was clearly a woman. She wore a black dress that perfectly matched the clothing found on the Delta King eight days earlier. The body was brought in for an autopsy and was identified as 46-year-old Dorothy Millette. And it's possible that the full story behind Paul Byrne's death died alongside her. After the dust settled from the initial media frenzy, the story of Paul Byrne disappeared from the papers. But as the years wore on, people started looking a little bit closer at the details. In 1960, screenwriter Ben Hecht published a story that suggested Paul, his good friend, had been murdered and called the investigation and coverage of his death suicide whitewash. The L.A. County District Attorney expressed interest in reopening the case after the release of Hecht's article, but he later decided against it saying there wasn't enough evidence. In 1990, Samuel Marks, the former MGM story editor, published his book, Deadly Illusions. It laid out lots of evidence to support the theory that Dorothy Millette killed Paul Byrne. At this point, many researchers seemed to side with his account. Between Dorothy's confirmed mental instability, her obsession with becoming a film star and the fact that she mysteriously killed herself so soon after Paul was found dead, well, it seems undeniable. Of course, there's no way to ever know for sure, but the original location of the gun, several feet away from his body, suggests he was murdered. Unfortunately, because so much evidence seems to have been tampered with by the higher-ups at MGM, it's hard to come to any firm conclusions. But what the world does have in spades is proof that Paul Byrne was nothing like the man depicted in those countless articles. He had a generous heart and was willing to put his loved ones before himself time and time again. There is no better testament to this than the fact that, despite being a famous Hollywood producer, Paul's fortune at the time of his death amounted to only about $2,500. Most people of his caliber would have had five times that much in their savings alone, but not Paul. Most of the money he had accrued in the film industry went to friends, family, and those in need. The real tragedy of this story is how the tabloid press turned a possible suicide into a salacious gossip story that tarnished Paul's name and integrity. For years, it was believed that Paul Byrne, the producer with a heart of gold, was abusive, impotent, and deceitful. And while justice has by no means been served, the legacy of a man with a heart as big as his ambitions has at least been restored. ¶¶ 